إلهنا ما أعد لك مليك كل من ملك لبيك قد لبيت لك لبيك إن الحمد لك إلهنا ما أعد لك مليك كل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to everyone who is joining us and who will be joining us to our first um, Hajj of the Heart series with Sheikh Arsalan. Uh, today we're very honored to have Sheikh Arsalan with us to speak a little bit on this topic and before I have him speak I would like to you know introduce Sheikh as well a little bit. Sheikh Arsalan Haq was born in Pakistan and raised in College Tex College Station, Texas. He graduated from Texas A&M University in 2001 with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. After working for a few years in Houston, he traveled to Damascus, where he studied the Arabic language and other Islamic sciences for two years. In 2007, he moved to Cairo to further his pursuit of the sacred sciences and graduated with a bachelor's degree from the College of Sharia at Al-Azhar University. During his stay in the Middle East, he was blessed to study with scholars from all over the world, including Syria, Egypt, Yemen, and the Indian subcontinent, receiving teaching licenses or ijazat from them in Quranic recitation, hadith, uh, the shafi'i fiqh, usul fiqh, and the tasawwuf. After returning to the United States in 2013, he served at the assistant as the assistant imam of the Muslim community of Troy and the resident imam of the Islamic Association of Allen. He currently serves as the resident scholar of the Islamic Association of Collin County and the director and as the director of Taqwa Seminary. So we're extremely blessed and honored to have Sheikh here with us today, um, and we look forward to benefiting from his words. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Jazakallahu khairan. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla wa anta ya hayu ya qayyum taj'alu alhazna idha shi'ta sahlan sahla. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وحسن أخلاقنا بالحلم واجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله dear brothers and sisters it is my honor and pleasure to uh, be speaking to all of you and uh, inshallah ta'ala, I'm looking forward with a lot of excitement to uh, join all of you uh, in this journey to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, inshallah ta'ala, uh, the plan for this webinar is <clears throat> I will speak on the topic for hopefully about maybe 30 uh, minutes or so, 30, 35 minutes, and then... Um, you know, if there are any questions after that, then we can take those questions as well, inshallah ta'ala. <clears throat> what I want to begin with, dear brothers and sisters, is uh, by way of reminder, perhaps for most of us, and for some of us, perhaps uh, we uh, have not heard uh, some of these things, but I wanted to mention a few ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding the tremendous virtue and merit of Hajj, and this is uh, in the hopes of inshallah taala getting in the right uh, mindset and in the right spirit for Hajj. I know that uh, there tends to be a lot of logistical details and preparations that go into preparing for Hajj, uh, you know, um, uh, there tend to be uh, challenges on the way, uncertainties on the way, and all the way until you go to Hajj, and in fact, complete your Hajj, it's very easy to become drowned 
in all of these logistical challenges and details. But if we, inshallah ta'ala, keep reminding ourselves of some of these virtues that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us about hajj, then it makes the entire experience not just easier, but much more fulfilling and, and much more impactful for us. So one of the things that I'm sure most of us, if not all of us know, is hajj is an act of ibadah that removes our sins. And this is based on a couple of texts from the Prophet wasallam. In one hadith, he said, whoever performs hajj for the sake of Allah and does not speak obscenely nor commits uh, acts of impiety, he returns home free of sin, like the day his mother gave birth to him. So in this text, the Prophet wasallam is telling us that a haji or a hajja comes back home after having performed hajj free of sin, like a newborn baby, like the day your mother gave birth to you. SubhanAllah, what an incredible reward for hajj. However, the Prophet ﷺ in this text also uh, mentions a couple of conditions for this to happen. And one of the conditions is to perform hajj for the sake of Allah. Whoever performs hajj for the sake of Allah. And so it is very, very important that we purify our intentions, that the hajj that we want to make is not just something that has been on my bucket list that I need to put a check mark next to so that I can tell people, I finished this task and removed this from my list of items to do. No, it's just, it's not just for that. It's not just to say to people that I have achieved this, that I have accomplished this. That shouldn't be the drive. That shouldn't be the motivation. The motivation is I want to do it for my Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala because he loves this from me. So whoever performs hajj for the sake of Allah, not to show off, not to tell people I've done two, three, four, five, ten hajjat for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second condition does not speak obscenely nor commits acts of impiety. And so throughout the hajj journey, I need to be careful about the use of my tongue how I speak to people, how I talk to people, and how I carry myself, how I use my eyes, my ears, my tongue, how I behave, how I carry myself can make or break my hajj. If I want to be able to come back from hajj, like the day that my mother gave birth to me, then I have to do my part. I have to try my best to control my tongue, control my ears, especially if I am going with other people on Hajj, family members, friends. If they're going to be accompanying me, we're going to be together all the time. It is very easy for people to get annoyed with one another, to lose their temper, and to ruin their Hajj. So these few days, inshallah ta'ala, we have to try our best to control our temper so that we can attain this magnificent reward of hajj. Another text of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is related actually by Amr ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who said that when Allah instilled the love of Islam in my heart, I went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O Prophet of Allah, stretch out your hand so that I may pledge my allegiance to you. So pause here. Amr ibn al-As, he, uh, he was hostile against Islam and Muslims for a long time. It wasn't until right before the conquest of Mecca 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened his heart to Islam. So he's saying that when that finally happened, when Allah instilled the love of Islam in my heart after years of opposing it, I decided to go to the Prophet Sallallahu So he arrives in front of Rasulullah Sallallahu and he says, O Prophet of Allah, stretch out your hand so that I may pledge my allegiance to you. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stretched out his hand towards me, but I withdrew my hand. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, O Amr, what's the matter with you? So I said, I would like to stipulate a condition. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, what is that condition? And so I said that all my past sins be forgiven. You see, he's concerned. Amr is concerned because he has fought against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in battles. And so he's concerned that he has all this baggage with him. So he says, my condition for embracing Islam is that all my past sins be forgiven. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, O oh, Amr, do you not know that Islam eradicates all past sins and migration eradicates all sins and Hajj eradicates all past sins? SubhanAllah. So the first part of this, I, I'm sure all of us knew before that Islam, somebody who embraces Islam, all of their past sins are forgiven. But in the same sentence, subhanAllah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that not only does Islam eradicate all past sins, but migration, hijrah, and sins. So, you know, subhanAllah, so excited and happy when we be converting to Islam and we go and hug that person and we always remind ourselves that this person is like a newborn baby, completely fresh slate, right? Clean of any sins, right? A haji, somebody who performs hajj, it is just like that person, subhanAllah. So this is the invitation that we are going to, inshallah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with an opportunity, inshallah, to go on this journey and come back having all of our sins forgiven, inshallah ta'ala. Now, in another text, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no reward for an accepted hajj except paradise. The word that he used was hajj mabrur. There is no reward for a hajj mabrur except Jannah. Now, what is hajj mabrur? Hajj mabrur is not just a hajj in which you fulfill all the external rites of hajj. That hajj where you fulfill all the external rites is called a hajj that is sahih, a hajj that is valid. But for a hajj to be mabrur, I have to go beyond that. Hajj mabrur is a hajj which is free of sin. Which is free of sin. And when I perform a hajj like that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala graces me with acceptance and pleasure from him. That's what a hajj mabrur is. When Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala was asked, about Hajj Mabrur, he said, Hajj Mabrur is that Hajj after which an aversion for the material worldly life is created and an inclination to the hereafter is brought about. So a Hajj Mabrur is a transformative Hajj. It's a Hajj from which when I return, my attachment to the material world is reduced, is decreased. And my attachment to the hereafter is magnified and is increased. So we all should be aiming for a hajj that is not just complete, not just valid, but a hajj that is mabrur, that is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also said something very special about one of the rites of Hajj, which is the most important rite of Hajj, which is the day of Arafah, standing at Arafat. And the Prophet Sallallahu said that there is no day when Allah saves more of his servants from the fire of hell than the day of Arafat. He draws near and 
praises them to the angels, saying, what do my servants want? And so, inshallah ta'ala, as we are in the, the land of Arafat, no matter how difficult it may be, no matter how hot it may be, we should remind ourselves of this. The crowds that we're going to see, inshallah ta'ala, those crowds, uh, you know, may be uncomfortable for us to be around so many people, but actually those crowds are so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala boasts about all of these people that are standing there, yes, with sweaty bodies and with, you know, a smell coming off of their bodies and with their hair disheveled and their beards disheveled, all wanting one thing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask on that day to his angels, what do all of these people want? And the angels are going to say, and Allah already knows the answer. Uh, angels are going to say, they want your forgiveness. They want your mercy. They want your acceptance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too generous to leave us empty handed on that day. So that is uh, uh, the day on which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves more of his servants from the fire of hell than on any other day of our lives, inshallah ta'ala. Two more texts from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One is uh, especially for our sisters, especially for our sisters. Because Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha reported that she once said to the Prophet, Ya Nabi Allah, Ya Rasulullah, Jihad is the best action. You know, she has learned from the Prophet ﷺ because of his regular exhortation for the Sahaba to go out to fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She knows the special virtue of jihad. So she's saying jihad is the best action. Should we women then not actively participate in it? SubhanAllah. So she's eager to earn that reward that she has learned from the Prophet Sallallahu about jihad. But at the same time, she also knows that especially at that time, in that society, in the way that things were, worked in the world at that time, women did not really go out in the battlefield. It was rare for women to go out. And, and uh, uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had not made it mandatory for women to go out for jihad. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is saying, with all this reward for jihad, shouldn't we women also actively participate in it? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the best jihad for women is a hajj mabrur. Subhanallah. So a woman who comes back from hajj mabrur, not only is she coming back from Hajj, but it is as though she is coming back from a field of jihad, from the battlefield. So the jihad for women is a Hajj, especially if that Hajj is Hajj Mabrur, inshallah ta'ala. And the last text that I wanted to share with you is, again, to help, help us get into the right mindset for Hajj, is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the pilgrims are the guests of Allah. They are the guests of Allah. You know, SubhanAllah, when you are a guest at somebody's house, especially if, if that person is known to be very hospitable, very generous, right? What do you expect? How do you expect to be treated at that person's house? You know that you're going to have a good time there. You're going to be treated well. You're going to be pampered. You're going to be taken care of, right? The pilgrims are the guests of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ continued and he said, should they make dua, Allah will answer their dua. Should they seek forgiveness, Allah will forgive them. So subhanAllah, when we are going to Hajj, we are going as guests. And just as we expect to be treated like guests by the most generous of hosts, we should also do our duty and behave like a guest. We should behave like a guest. A guest does not make demands, my dear brothers and sisters. A guest does not make demands. A guest simply 
obeys whatever the host tells him to do. The host tells you, sit here, sit there. You sit wherever the host tells you to sit. The host says, you eat now, you eat later. You do whatever the host tells you to do. A guest is at the mercy of the host. That is the proper adab of a guest. And so when we go for hajj, we should act like guests, not as customers at a restaurant that are ready to make demands and our demands must be fulfilled. That attitude, dear brothers and sisters, can appear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as su'ul adab, as, as, as improper behavior, and it can cost us a hajj mabrur. So I remind myself and you, my dear brothers and sisters, to remember this hadith when we go there, that we are guests at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, a few things that I wanted to say about, you know, the uh, some of the spiritual uh, aspects of Hajj that I think are also very helpful uh, as we go on this journey, insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the fiqh of Hajj, you know, the do's and don'ts of Hajj, the external rights of Hajj, which are very important, but oftentimes we don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, we don't pay enough attention to the spiritual aspects of Hajj. One of the things that I think uh, uh, we should keep reminding ourselves is the the Kaaba, the Kaaba, is called Baytullah. Baytullah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala refers to it in the Quran as Bayti, my house, my house, and the fact that Allah calls it His house means that there is something very special about the Kaaba. You know, so it's very easy to, to get all material and say, you know, it's just rocks and stones. It's rocks and stones, but it's not just rocks and stones. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a human being with flesh and blood, but he was not just a human being. The Quran is a book with pages and ink, but it is not just a book. Anything that is associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything that he calls mine, my Nabi, my book, my house, it becomes special. And, and those who understand what this means, the longing that they have to just set their eyes on the Kaaba, just set their eyes on the Kaaba, because it is the house of my Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a, a story mentioned by Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his book, Sifatul Safwa, in which he said, دَخَلَ قَوْمٌ hujjaj." That a, a group of people, you know, in those days, they would come in caravans to perform hajj. So a, a group of people uh, were, were on their way to hajj and they had a lady in that group. And she kept asking the same question again and again and again on the journey, which was, Aina baytu rabbi? Aina baytu rabbi? Where is the house of my Lord? Where is the house of my Lord? And they kept saying to her, Inshallah, you will see it soon. Inshallah, you will see it soon. So then when they approach Mecca, and in those days, you know, the Kaaba is, is in a valley. And so you come and you approach it from the mountains and you see the Kaaba down there, right? So when they saw the Kaaba from a distance, قالوا, ربك, So they said to her, there, right there, do you see it? That is the house of your Lord. فخرجت, so she started to increase her pace, rushing towards the Kaaba. And she started repeating, the house of my Lord, the house of my Lord, until she arrives all the way to the Kaaba, 
and she goes through the crowds and she approaches the Kaaba and she puts her face on the Kaaba, her forehead on the Kaaba. And Ibn al-Jawzi says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا رَفَعَتْ إِلَّا مَيْتَ That I swear by Allah, she did not raise her head away from the Kaaba until her soul had left her body. SubhanAllah. The longing, the shawq, the, the desire, the passion with which she wanted to arrive at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because she knows what this is. And so, dear brothers and sisters, that's where we're going. That's where we're going. And subhanAllah, you know, with all of these modern technologies, with live streaming and pictures and, and videos and so on, we see the Kaaba so much that sometimes actually we become... Uh, we lose that 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 spark. You know, somebody like her was never seen the Kaaba. She sees it for the first time. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all of us, whether we're going for the first time or second time or the tenth time, that when we see the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we feel inside of us that energy, that burst of energy that brings tears to the eyes and that we go with that passion insha'Allah ta'ala uh, with which insha'Allah ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will see sincerity in our hearts. Now, um, a few more things about the, 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 the spirit of Hajj. Of course, the Al-Masjid Al-Haram is full of miraculous things. The Black Stone, the Maqam Ibrahim. Uh, they're very, very special things. As we know, these are stones that came down from uh, Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws our attention to them as ayat from him that are there for us to see. When we are at Maqam Ibrahim, we're literally looking at a stone from Jannah. And when we when we see Maqam Ibrahim, we're looking at the feet, the footprints of Ibrahim alayhi salam, who stood there and made the call to Hajj that we are responding to. And if we are fortunate enough to go all the way to Maqam Ibrahim, then it's like we are here. And that's what we're saying. لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ I'm here, my Lord. I'm here at your service, my Lord. So Maqam Ibrahim, uh, the black stone, these are, these are wonderful, miraculous aspects uh, for us to experience while we are uh, around the Kaaba. But as you know, the Hajj is more than the Kaaba. It, it, there's many other things that we do in Hajj. So as we uh, um, let me just very quickly go over the itinerary of Hajj from a spiritual lens, not from a fiqhi lens, but from a spiritual lens. So the first thing, of course, we're going to do is we're going to depart for Hajj. We're going to leave for Hajj. And as we're leaving for Hajj, we need to leave behind our sins and our bad habits. When we leave our house, our mindset should be that I am leaving my old lifestyle behind and I'm going to come back a new me. That's how I should bid farewell to the people in my home, in my family, among my friends. I say al wada to them because I am not coming back as me. I'm going to come back as a new person. So I depart for Hajj. And Hajj, Hajj, dear brothers and sisters, a lot of us don't realize this. Hajj linguistically means qasd. And qasd means to have an aim, to have a goal. So when I'm going for Hajj, I am aiming at something. And what is it that I am aiming at? The body, the, the aim of the body is al-Masjid al-Haram, the Kaaba. But the aim of the Qalb is Rabbul Kaaba, is the Lord of the Kaaba. And you know, when, when, when we set our aim right, 
when we set our destination, right? When we put in the GPS, our destination, that once we put the destination, right? That inshallah, it's only a matter of time that we will arrive at that destination. And so if I disengage my qalb from all these distractions and collect it and focus on the aim, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah, it is only a matter of time that I will arrive in the divine presence with all of my heart, inshallah wa ta'ala. But in order to do that, my aim has to be focused, which means that I cannot allow myself to be distracted by things that are going to happen around me including people who are going to annoy me, right? Including people who are going to be aggressive and hostile and angry and things may not go the way that I had expected and planned. But that's all part of the test whether my, my aim is focused, right? And so do not become aggressive. Do not become hostile. Do not shift your focus away from that aim to the aim of now responding back and arguing and getting your right. Forget about your rights, my dear brothers and sisters. Forget about your rights. Don't come with the attitude of entitlement that I deserve this. I paid for this. Don't argue. Allah says, Wala jidala fil hajj. That is going to be my test and your test. We are going on hajj. We have a qasd. We have a maqsad. We have a goal. We have an aim. And I'm not going to allow anything to divert my attention away from my maqsad, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's my goal. I enter ihram. Ihram is from haram. Haram is a sanctuary. Al-Masjid al-Haram, the sacred mosque. Haram is a sanctuary. And so when I enter ihram, I am entering with my heart a spiritual sanctuary and I need to leave this temporal world and disengage from it. And I say, لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لا شريك لك I am saying لبيك responding to the call made by Ibrahim alayhi salam Here I am my Lord at your service لا شريك لك You have no partners I will not allow anything to distract me from you يا رب العالمين and keep repeating this talbiya, and it is very helpful if I pay attention to the meaning here. It's very helpful against the distractions and the annoyances that are going to come my way during Hajj. La sharika laka, labbaik, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk. All praise is yours. I am in praise of you by you. Despite what is happening around me, there is plenty for me to be thankful of you. So, inna alhamda laka wa ni'mata laka wa laka al mulk. La sharika laka. Wal mulk. Everything belongs to you. Everything belongs to you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So, I continue on my journey and I arrive at Arafat. The most important element of Hajj. The most important Rukn of Hajj. Arafat. Arafat. And as we mentioned the Hadith, Allah boasts to the angels about those who stand in the grounds of Arafat. And there I stand uh, 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 waiting for me to be cleansed. I'm standing in dua, imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cleanse me, to, 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 to purify me, right? And, and so I admit my, my mistakes, my, my uh, disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I am truly in a state of humility, then how can I act arrogantly over there? How can I get into fights with people just because I didn't get enough food for lunch or breakfast, 
right? No, I need to leave my arrogance. I need to leave my vanity because I am coming with utter humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for me to be cleansed, for me to be cleansed. And yes, I am going to smell, I am going to sweat on that day. But as I start to stink uh, physically, it is meant to remind me of how my sins make me stink spiritually. And that is why I want to be cleansed, because this is my spiritual state. I want to be cleansed. And so I, I, I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me permission to go to a, a station that is closer to my destination. Remember, the destination is the house of Allah. But... I will go through the station of Muzdalifa. And Muzdalifa is from Izdalafa, which means to come closer, to approach. To come closer, to approach. So I go to Muzdalifa, and that is my second washing station. I get cleansed further in Muzdalifa. And then I go next to Mina. Mina is also called Muna. And Muna means desire because this is where my desire to arrive at the house of Allah increases. I am closer now. And this is where it is said that Adam alayhi salam, when he came down to earth, he came to Mina and this is where he missed Jannah. So he had Muna, he had desire for Jannah here. <clears throat> and so we show our desire to do ziyara of the Kaaba in Tawafu Ziyara, we show that desire here, and that is why it's called Mina. And of course, I'm going to cast my pebbles here because this is where the shaitan attempted to dissuade Ibrahim alayhi salam from sacrificing his son. And so we are going to uh, live, relive the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam by, by casting pebbles at those pill at the at Jamratul Aqaba on the 10th day of the Hijjah. <clears throat> and with every throw, I need to make a commitment that I will not obey shaitan. Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than you, O shaitan. Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than you, O shaitan. I am making that pact that I will not obey shaitan once I leave from here. And then, of course, my sacrifice is offered, uh, again, reliving the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam, who offered his son in sacrifice. But I, internally, I should be slaughtering my nafs and my, the attachments that I have built with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I get my head shaved or trimmed. And of course, nobody likes to shave. But that's the whole point, because shaving is meant to subdue my nafs, to kill whatever is remaining in the nafs after Arafat and Muzdalifa and the Jamarat. And once I shave, now I can put on perfume. Now I'm out of Ihram. Now I can put on perfume, because now I'm going to visit the house. Now I'm going to visit the house. And so I go for Tawafu Ziyara. It's called Tawafu Ziyara because I'm just going to visit the house. I'm going to come back to Mina. I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to come back to Mina and I'm going to remain in Mina for the next couple of days as guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being hosted by Allah. We're going to eat. We're going to drink. We're going to behave like guests. And we are going to be in dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for two to three days. So we have to be careful not to fall into ghafla, not to become heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not to become so relaxed that we lose control over our tongues and our ears. Hajj is not over yet. Hajj is not over yet. We need to save our hajj mabroor. So we need to be very careful in these two to three days. This is a time to renew our desire to free ourselves from the shaitan. And so we're going to go every day to stone the shaitan at the three pillars. And then finally, the very last thing that we do as we depart for, for back for our homes is tawaful wada. 
tawaf al wada which is the uh, farewell uh, um, farewell tawaf to bid farewell to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hearts insha'Allah that will be longing to come back not happy to leave but uh, seeking permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to leave with, with hopes and desires that we will come back again soon. So this with this spirit, inshallah ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us and facilitate for us to make hajj, not just with our bodies, but with our minds, with our hearts, with our souls, with all of us, inshallah ta'ala, so that we benefit from our journey and we come back truly with gifts from our most generous host with the greatest gift, which is Hajj Mabrur. Insha'Allah ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me and you a Hajj Mabrur. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa salli Allahumma wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Prepare for the transformative journey of a lifetime. Visit our website and follow us for more information. Look.